You know what? I've been around for a while. I've traveled the world, met some interesting people, done some crazy things. So you might just think there's not much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Does the brain have the power to kill? Can the mind become our most powerful weapon? The U.S. Army investigates the paranormal, asking if future conflicts could be fought using mind control. Or the boy who loses his thumb in a horrific accident, only to have it grow back thanks to a mysterious magical powder. Can we really regenerate our limbs? And in Indonesia, an incredible archaeological find. Did humans once share the earth with a race of hobbits? Yep. It's a weird world. And I love it. Throughout time, magicians, psychics, and mentalists have claimed that they can move or lift objects, walk through walls, and affect the outcome of events, or even cause bodily harm using only the power of thought. But do these paranormal powers actually exist? Can humans really use their mind to affect matter? But come on, I hear you say, psychic power for real? What level-headed person would possibly take such a crazy idea seriously? Well, how about the United States Army? In the late 1970s, the U.S. military did something extraordinary. A group of top soldiers started to investigate whether the mind could be used as a weapon. Among them was retired U.S. Army Colonel John Alexander. We had been blindsided by the Soviets on several occasions. And so we had some senior leaders who were willing to explore uh, very unique areas, and paranormal phenomena was one of those. The Army set up a top secret operation called the Stargate Project. Its mission, to harness paranormal powers for military use. Some soldiers felt they had experienced the paranormal while advancing through enemy territory in the jungles of Vietnam. They called it Point Man Syndrome. When certain people are on point, uh, they sense things like where mines were, ambushes and whatnot. Other people don't have that. Why? Don't know. John Alexander investigated psychokinesis, the ability to move objects just by thinking. His experimentation started with spoon bending. We had a session at my house. Uh, General Stubblebine, who was the head of uh, ISCOM, at the time was present and we had a truly phenomenal event occur directly in front of us. At this top secret session, a psychic was asked to demonstrate the power of the mind. The guy held up a fork and this thing just dropped over 90 degrees and we saw that and we said, wow, need to look into how you can do that sort of thing. And so that led to the process, uh, and we set up a program to do that. I ended up being able to teach this, and we used it not because bending cutlery makes any sense at all. It was to get mindset. It was how do you convince people not to think within the box, if you will. Alexander focused his unit's time and resources into learning this psychokinesis. Amazingly, it wasn't long before he started to get results. This particular one was a lieutenant colonel. He was holding these forks just like this. They used to be matched. Um, this thing dropped over a full 90 degrees with all of us watching, came back up and went to where it is now. And you can see that however you look at it, those are dramatically different. Absolutely no physical force involved. 
Encouraged by their success, Alexander and General Stubblebein started programs to train soldiers to use other paranormal powers like remote viewing. Remote viewing is a means of data acquisition. I guess you'd colloquially call it psychic spying. Uh, you had an individual who was in a chamber, in that case, usually at uh, Fort Meade. Uh, they were given specific targets, although they knew nothing about the target, and said, tell us about what's going on at that uh, location. The Russians had built a huge concrete structure on the White Sea in the Arctic Circle, but U.S. intelligence had no idea what it was for. Alexander asked remote viewer number one, Joe McMoneagle, to use his psychic powers to see inside. And he described the building. All they gave him initially, by the way, were coordinates. Described the building, then went inside, looked, and said, there's a big submarine in there. And he described it and says it's double hauled. It's, most interesting is that the uh, missiles are forward of the sail. And before that, all of them had been behind and a number of other technologies to which our boat builders said, you can't do that. If you build a submarine that big, it would go to depth and crush and whatnot. Well, guess what? It became known as the Typhoon-class submarine. Again, our intelligence community had totally missed it because we had not heard that there were changes coming. We also did not believe you know, this uh, cerebral centrism that anybody else could do it. Unknown to the U.S., the Russians had developed a, a new ultra-secret class of submarine, the largest in the world with multiple titanium pressure hulls. And now, thanks to the supposed paranormal power of a U.S. Army soldier, the Russians' secret was out. Was this result an incredible stroke of luck? A coincidence? Or had the military application of remote viewing, psychic espionage, actually paid off? There's usually a pretty simple explanation for what seems to be an extraordinary event. Jim Underdown has devoted his life to testing the claims of paranormal powers. And we take it upon ourselves to use science to explain why some people hold some of these beliefs. We do test people who make paranormal claims, so it depends on what the nature of their claim is. The Center for Inquiry invites people to prove their powers in a scientifically acceptable testing environment. Well, we had a woman who um, claimed to look inside the human body and tell if a kidney was missing or not. Uh, she failed her test. We had people who uh, claimed to be able to send words from one person to another. Um, he failed. So lots of people come forward with these claims. Zero are successful. In fact, Underdown thinks their claimed powers have more to do with magic than with the supernatural. Magicians are helpful in making inquiries into some of these claims because we suspect fraud sometimes. And sometimes the simplest parlor magic trick is employed in the guise of a supernatural power. Skeptic investigator and magician Mark Edward knows how spoon bending is done. He feels it has nothing to do with paranormal powers. A lot of people are interested in spoon bending, so I'm gonna just show you uh, how easy it really is if you, if you focus your mind. So focus on Ben, think of Ben. Ben, yes, it's, I can feel it starting to loosen, yes. Just slightly, a little more. Keep concentrating. There we go, yes. Whoa. A lot of psychic energy in the room. And let's just try, try and get this part. This is really good. You'll see it just droop. <laughs> Mark is a magician, so he can't reveal how the trick is done. But one version goes something like this. The spoon is already bent, but Mark is hiding the handle behind his fingers. Mark has a false handle, which he pinches to make it look like the spoon is straight. Releasing his grip makes the false handle drop so it looks like the spoon is bending. When Mark shows us the bent spoon, he's actually diverting attention away from the fact he's pocketing the false handle. Try and get this part. This is really good. Oh, yeah. I would say it's possible to make the mistake of thinking that your mental state could aid you in bending the spoon. It is impossible to think that the spoon could bend on its own without cheating. In order for the spoon to bend on its own, you have to cheat. There is no 
physical way to do that. For Jim Underdown, most claims of paranormal ability, including the ones researched by the U.S. Army, are a hoax. So do the U.S. military waste millions of tax dollars on paranormal research? After all, it's all nonsense, right? Well, maybe not. You see, it's not just the Army that has taken such spookiness seriously. Researchers at Stanford and Princeton universities studied phenomena like ESP and psychokinesis for 30 years. And today, some scientists believe laboratory evidence for such psychic ability might actually exist. This is an experiment looking at the relationship between mind and matter. Braden believes the human mind is capable of interacting with something far smaller than spoons, photons, the subatomic particles that make up light. Lisa is asked to place her attention on an optical system, which has a laser beam in it. Hidden from view, a laser shoots a beam of photons through two tiny slits etched in a slide to create an interference pattern. But she's at a distance, she's not able to see the beam itself, but she's asked to imagine that she could see the beam. And we're, so what we're checking is whether or not pure awareness alone is able to interact with the physical world. According to his theory, if psychokinesis exists, the subject should be able to influence the nature of the interference pattern just by thinking about the photons. This picture here is showing what the camera sees in the double slit system. And here, we're measuring what's happening in her brain. So we want to see, is there a relationship between the EEG and the interference pattern? If we can show that the relationship exists, then that's showing a mind-matter interconnection. The experiment begins. Welcome to the double slit experiment. Please relax. OK. The subject is asked to imagine, in her mind's eye, the interference pattern. You may now relax. Then she's told to ignore the pattern completely. At the conclusion of the experiment, the images of the interference pattern are compared to the EEG readout. These, these colors are showing the degree of correlation. If it's positive, we get a redder color. And so this is interesting. This, su this suggests that when Lisa is paying attention to the optical system, we actually see a change in the optical system, even though she's doing it in her mind. And when she's not paying attention to the optical system, you get a very different pattern of activity. Could this just be coincidence? If we see red, it means that there's a relationship. If we see this kind of red, it means it's a highly significant relationship. It's meaningful that the relationship that we're seeing is not chance. It's a real effect. So can the mind affect matter after all? Raiden's findings are controversial, and the majority of scientists remain skeptical about psychokinesis. Nevertheless, anecdotal reports suggest that the U.S. military still takes it seriously and restarted its paranormal research in the wake of 9-11. Probably the biggest thing that happened was causing people to think and think differently and to think beyond the realm of the possible as they knew it. So, whether psychokinesis turns out to be a genuine phenomena embraced by those with open minds or merely cynical sleights of hand, the U.S. military's investigation into whether the mind could be used as a psychic weapon is definitely weird. Or what? Ow! Almost lost a finger there. Need to hang on to that little pinky for a while yet. But did you know that if I were a salamander or a newt, it wouldn't be such a big deal after all. If they lose a limb or a tail, they can grow another. Wouldn't that kind of ability be cool? But why would a newt be chopping vegetables? Oh! Can humans regenerate their limbs? Sounds like science fiction. Well, it's not. As this next story will show, the future 
is most definitely here. South Florida 2009 is a typical day for the Mraz family. Father Froilan goes outside to wash the family car. He's accompanied by his two small sons, Froilan Jr. and 14-month-old Jeeva. Their mother, Jeanette, is inside. What happened next was the beginning of a bizarre journey into the scientific unknown. He was stepping out. He was coming out from the house to um, the outside when Yvonne was following him. He never noticed that Yvonne was behind him. He shut the door like a normal kid will do, and um, Yvonne was grabbing the edge of the door, and he shut the door. In an instant, Jeevan's right thumb is cut off just below the nail. I grabbed some rack, the towel from the kitchen, so I put it around his finger. Yes, we were like, we need to rush. Yeah, because he was lost in a lot of blood. She, I believe she was on her second towel uh, um, f um, no blood. So yeah, we, we just rushed to the hospital. As they rush to get medical aid, Jeanette and Froyland have no idea just how badly injured their baby son is. Doctors treat Jeevan's injury, but they tell his parents that since the rest of the thumb is missing, the boy's hand will be disfigured for life. We were at the hospital and waiting for the results. The doctor told us that probably he was going to lose his thumb. And that was a, a bad news for us at the moment. The Moraz family is devastated. They believe their youngest son will be permanently scarred and partially disabled. But days later, the pediatrician offers some hope. He sends them to a doctor named Juan Bravo. He has a controversial new treatment known as pixie dust. He thinks it could improve Jeevan's condition. The product is simple. It's a powder, and it's applied to the wound bed. And um, pretty much, you reapply, you re reapply every 24, 48 hours, and the tissue regenerates underneath it. Could Jeevan's finger be saved simply by using a magic dust? It's an extraordinary claim. We called the mother, and uh, I remember I, I, I called her and I said, listen, we, we've come upon a, a product that is supposed to be great for fingers. i got pictures to show you. Uh, it should not have any side effects or any you know, future complications for him. And um, we would like to try it with him. And uh, she was all up for it. But the powder has never been used on a baby before. With no guarantee of success, Jeanette and Froilan would have to take a risk. It was the first time that they had used that on a baby. So, I mean, I believe that it was a, a f uh, first trial. And we give them the yes. Knowing little of Pixie Dust's mysterious healing power, just days after the first application, Jeanette and Froilan checked Jeevan's wound. What they found was astonishing. We start seeing that his finger is started to get the shape. We were surprised. We never thought it was gonna work. We applied powder every 48 hours for the first two weeks, and then we spread it out to three times a week the third week, and there really was no need after the third week. It seems like science fiction. In just over three weeks, the seemingly miraculous had occurred. After severing his digit, Jeevan's thumb has grown back. Nail, fingerprint, and all. It uh, looks like 99% equal to his left thumb. When we finally removed the scab that was formed by the magic dust, uh, what was underneath it? It was normal skin, it was a normal finger. It was like it never happened. It's hard to believe that this finger was gonna regenerate that fast and heal that fast. I'm very happy. Yeah, I felt very happy to see that um, his finger grow. grow. But did the powder alone regenerate Jeevan's thumb? If so, how? Many pediatricians and other medical experts are skeptical. They believe the fact Jeevan's thumb regenerated is not that surprising. It's an ability that starts in the womb. We know that we can, that pretty serious injuries in, in fetuses can be completely healed normal like there was never an injury. What we do know, and I think everybody would uh, agree 
is that uh, young children, for example, if they cut off the tips of their fingers, they can re occasionally regrow them. That's not a miracle. It was going to happen anyway. But then, something extraordinary happened. What is uh, less easy to explain is when you, you get a, an individual like a Lee Spivak. In 2005, Lee Spivak, a 64-year-old man at the tip of his finger, cut off in a gruesome accident caused by a model airplane propeller. Weeks later, his finger grew back. It was possibly the first documented case of an adult regenerating a body part. Remarkably, Lee Spivak's doctor suggested using the same powder Dr. Bravo applied four years later on Jiva. Had the pixie dust now regenerated an adult human finger? Dr. Ashkan Giovanni is a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. He believes this kind of regeneration in humans is not possible. Well, limb generation itself, uh, limb regeneration itself, is more possible in salamanders and the lizard family. In human beings, uh, you can regenerate skin, but to actually regenerate all the parts of a limb, the bones, the skin, the soft tissue, fat, tendons, nerves, that's impossible for that to occur. Can body parts really grow back from just having the affected area sprinkled in some mysterious magical powder? Apparently so. And it turns out this powder is not so magical after all. It's made up of something called ECM, extra cellular matrix. What's ECM? I don't know. Steve Badalak is a research professor from the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Extracellular matrix is the uh, glue that holds all of the cells in our body together. All tissues, as, as most people know, are made up of cells, different cell types, skin cells, muscle cells, heart cells. So extracellular matrix is, a, is what you might think of as an instructive template uh, that all the cells in, our, in which all the cells of our body live. We can make powder forms, we can make sheet forms that look like sheets, uh, we can make uh, uh, gels out of it. And these are important for different therapeutic applications. Extracellular matrix is the scaffolding upon which all tissue in the body is built. This mix of protein and connective tissue can signal the body to start the process of regrowth if applied to a wound. Some scientists even believe it may be possible to use extracellular matrix to regrow an entire digit or limb. It changes the default mechanism of healing of the body. It's something that uh, basically Mother Nature's been working on for hundreds of millions of years of R&D, if you want to think of it that way. So we're just harvesting it and saying, okay, we know we're never going to do as good, so let's just see if we can collect this stuff without messing it up. So where do scientists get their ECM? Well, here's a clue. It's a cute, cuddly, pink farm animal that just happens to have loads of therapeutic ECM, perfect for regrowing limbs. Yes, no brainer. It's pigs. But why? Pigs are a convenient and an abundant source of extracellular matrix. The tissues from which they're made, like skin, small intestine, urinary bladder, are throwaway products of the agricultural industry. So here's something, here's a tissue that would have been waste or maybe turned into fertilizer. Uh, we're now using as a medical device, a regenerative medicine tool for reconstruction of tissue. Pigs are genetically similar to humans. Because of this, proteins found in their bladders can trigger a response in us. But how do they harvest it? So to prepare the extracellular matrix, we start with the raw pig bladder. And then by using an acrylic scraper, we simply spread the tissue, um, loosen the muscle fiber. Using forceps, then we grab that muscle and literally pull and tear it away from the underlying matrix. So that's the, the outside layer, which is referred to as the abluminal layer, which is where the muscle was attached. It then goes through what is referred to as a parasitic acid wash. At the end of that stage, the ECM is ready for use. It can be freeze-dried and used as a dry sheet. That sheet then can either be used as is or be ground into a fine powder. But not everyone is convinced that ECM is the answer to this mystery. Rocky Tuan is the director of the Center of Cellular and Molecular Engineering. He believes there's another explanation why Lee Spivak and G-Van's fingertips grew back. 
They may have a unique genetic predisposition that enables them to do it. The possibility of regenerating finger is definitely there, uh, as shown by uh, these uh, uh, results. He may very well have a uh, genetic, or maybe even epigenetic, uh, constitution that allows him to respond in this manner. Is it possible that people like Jivan and Lee are able to regenerate while most of us can't? Could we exploit their incredible ability? Before we can find the answer, far more research needs to be done. What we're trying to do is trying to figure out how, in rare instances, uh, people are able to grow, what the mechanisms are, and then also in situations where they can't regenerate, and then try to compare the two. And by doing so, we hope to identify those factors or cells or genes that are responsible for this process. And that's how we can move forward. One way this may be possible is through stem cell research. Found throughout growing embryos, but in only certain places in adults, stem cells are unique because they can become almost any type of tissue in the body, while other cell types like muscle or skin are fixed and unchangeable. They're sort of like a wild card in a game of poker. Now, if scientists can figure out how to reprogram any cell into a stem cell through genetic manipulation, then it may be possible to regrow body parts wherever there is damage. We can instruct uh, the body to regrow a body part. The, then uh, why, why wouldn't we do that? Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that someday we will be able to control uh, the way cells act in the body. In other words, we will be able to instruct the growth of new tissues and organs. But what we would like to do is be able to regrow your heart if you have a heart attack that destroys so much of the heart muscle that you're going to die. Uh, or to replace your kidney to get you off of dialysis. Or to regrow your esophagus so that you don't have to go through a life uh, of misery uh, after having it removed. Instead, we will grow you a new esophagus. This is not science fiction. Uh, it would have been science fiction 30 or 40 years ago. Could this eventually lead to the holy grail of all scientific discoveries? Could this give us eternal life? The fountain of youth it has always been the, uh, the holy grail. We may change the life expectancy. Uh, if you're able to better uh, locomote because you have better limbs and joints, you'll be more fit, for example, and maybe you eat better and, and feel better and so on and so forth, it'll probably affect your life expectancy. Imagine a world where no one gets old. What will our civilization look like in a hundred or a thousand years? Jeevan can say he had something to do with this. Is that weird or what? What if I was to tell you that long ago in a time before time in a remote land at the far edges of the known world lived a race of tiny people who lived in constant mortal fear of huge carnivorous dragons. You might say, big deal, Shatner, like we haven't seen Lord of the Rings. But what I'm talking about isn't an epic tale of fiction set in Middle Earth. What I'm talking about is a real race of hobbits that may once have existed and fought real dragons right here on our earth. Now I dare you to tell me that isn't weird or what? The remote island of Flores, Southeast Asia has one of the most bizarre ecosystems in the world. Inhabited by elephants, giant rats, and the deadly Komodo dragon. It is also the location of one of the most astounding archaeological discoveries in history. In 2001, a team of archaeologists traveled to the island and began excavating deep in a cave called Liangbo. Researchers started excavating at Liangbo, this limestone cave on Flores, Indonesia. And during the first uh, two years of excavation, they found some small bits of uh, human bone. 
uh, but they weren't sure exactly what it was. But then in 2003, they discovered more remains. This time, it was a complete skeleton of a 30-year-old female named LB1. Carbon dating said she lived around 18,000 years ago. What confounded experts was that she was unlike any other human being ever found. In looking at uh, our species, it certainly does not fit in. If it, if it was a member of our species, it would be very strange. The reason was astonishing. She was only around three feet tall, almost two and a half feet shorter than a modern North American woman. This is a very small individual. It was uh, around three foot, maybe a bit less than three feet in height. This remarkable discovery led this tiny, full-grown human specimen to be nicknamed the Hobbit. Was science fiction becoming science fact? An undiscovered human-like species only three feet tall sharing an island with Komodo dragons and giant rats. Sounds too incredible? The indigenous population of Flores think they know what this species is. The mythical Abu Gogo, a creature they believe once inhabited the island. The Abu Gogo are said to have been small, hairy cave dwellers, same size as the Hobbit. These creatures are claimed to have survived until as recently as the last century. Is the presence of the Hobbit skeletons proof that the legends were actually true? Legend or not, it's extraordinary, undeniable evidence on an Indonesian island of a fully grown human only three feet tall. How could this happen? Matt Tocheri is a paleoanthropologist, an expert in ancient people. He believes one possible reason for their tiny size could be related to a phenomena called island dwarfism. Island dwarfism is a description of a phenomena where in some cases in, on islands, say, or other uh, uh, ecological settings that are isolated, that some animals get larger and other animals get smaller. So rats and small animals tend to get larger, mostly because of access to resources as it relates to fertility. So, you know, if there's only so much food, you're better off to be smaller because then you can have more offspring. We don't know for sure if it happened in, in terms of the hobbits. It may have, but it may not have. Basically, the hobbit stands about a meter tall. And so that's, that's quite small for a full-grown adult. And we, don't, we haven't really seen body sizes of that, normal body sizes of that height for a long period of time in human evolution, going back more than two million years ago. So to find something like that, when we actually thought that sort of our body size increase, and particularly our lengthening of our legs, uh, was a big part of our human evolutionary story, that to find something that doesn't fit into that, and yet coexisted with us, is, is really quite strange. But why did these remarkable creatures disappear? What happened to them? Some theorize the hobbit may have become extinct because they were eaten by the island's Komodo dragon population. Not nice. The Komodo dragon was a part of the hobbits, as there's no question, just like it is the life of people that live on, on Komodo and Rinsha today. Did the hobbits go after Komodo dragons, or did the Komodo dragon go after the hobbits? These are questions that will continue to be uh, to, to answered. These are all possibilities. We're just not sure exactly how it played out. But whatever their fate, this extraordinary discovery confronted scientists with an amazing possibility. Our human evolutionary history is incomplete. And the hobbit is an entire new species. Well, the discovery on Flores has, has certainly broadened our understanding of human evolution. Uh, the, the general, does it change any of the general themes of what we've known? Not really. But it does show us that we come from a very diverse family tree and that some of those branches of that tree subsisted for a lot longer than we thought previously. Generally, we thought things like Homo floresiensis uh, went extinct a million or two million years ago, and yet now we see them living very well on an isolated island in Indonesia up until even 18,000 years ago when modern humans are definitely in the near area. Knowing that there was a totally different early human species living on Earth, coexisting with us, that looks so different than us, is something that was really mind-blowing to the scientific community. 
Well, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I think it adds a real level of diversity to our family tree. And seeing something that in some ways looks so primitive, that is so recent in time, is really this great experiment in being human. No matter what you thought it was, it's just an incredible find. I remember when it was first announced, you know, many, many scientists, uh, including myself, were very skeptical about it. I mean, could this really be real? Uh, but over time, you know, the evidence has just been consistently presented that shows us that, yeah, this is legitimate different species than, than our own. Whilst the discovery of the Hobbit excited many scientists, others were less convinced. I had a different viewpoint on this from the outset because when I read that first paper about the skeleton, it just didn't fit. And so I looked for an alternative explanation. So is the Hobbit skull just a lone example? Or is there other evidence that can prove it is a new species of human relative? Is there anything else unique about the Hobbit? Well, turns out they do have one distinctive characteristic that many experts say is proof that it is a separate species. Matt Tocheri is a paleoanthropologist, an expert in ancient people. Matt has studied bones of the hobbit's wrist. He believes the unique structure is proof that this is a new species. The reasons why I think it's a different species uh, stem largely from my own research, which happens to be on the evolution of the wrist in humans and our close relatives, the great apes. So there's been some big changes to our wrist in the last uh, million years. Well, Homo fresiensis doesn't show those changes. And so that basically says to me that it must be descended from an ancestor prior to that a million years ago because it doesn't share the derived anatomy we see in us and Neanderthals. Matt found that a key bone in the hobbit's wrist is different to modern humans and more similar to a chimpanzee or ape. He believes this means that the hobbit is in fact a new and unknown species of human cousin. Uh, in terms of the wrist evidence, you can see that it, it's remarkably similar to what we see in chimpanzees. Now, that doesn't mean it's more closely related to a chimpanzee because the hobbits share anatomy with modern humans and Neanderthals that chimpanzees don't. But what the wrist shows to us is that it retains the anatomy of the primitive hominin, and so it must have branched off prior to this new morphology evolving. And that's pretty amazing. This compelling evidence was presented to the world scientific community. Since there were portions of other hobbit skeletons found, they classified it as its own species, with the Latin name Homo florensicis. But anthropologist Robert Martin has a different theory to explain the mystery of the hobbit. This skull is really quite unusual. The skeleton is quite unusual, and so you can understand why people said it, it must be a new species. It's a very unusual individual. Martin believes the Hobbit's inclusion into our evolutionary history was based on too little evidence. Archaeologists only recovered one skull among all the skeletal remains. And the point I really want to emphasize is that we have fragments of other individuals, but we only have one skull. If they had found two or three or four skulls that were all the same, it would be much more difficult to argue. We should be very, very careful about basing huge interpretations on single specimens. Dr. Martin feels the skull isn't consistent with our evolutionary history. He believes its small size raises a big problem. The hobbit's skeleton is nearly 18,000 years old. If what we know about human evolution is true, the hobbit's brain should be larger than it is. You have to go back three million years to find a brain that's small. But over the last three million years, the brain has got bigger in every other single hominid except this one. So that's a problem. If we look at all of the known hominid skulls and plot out the brain size, you get a very nice curve. And the only thing that doesn't fit is this hobbit from Flores. Martin has an amazing theory of his own. He suggests that the hobbit skeleton actually belongs to a modern human from Flores who suffered from a congenital disease known as microcephalia. And microcephalic simply means small head. It is a, a, a developmental abnormality. It's the cast of the skull of a modern human microcephalic, a small-brained modern human, 
And this brain is exactly the same size as in The Hobbit. Another convincing piece of evidence is that this disease also has another side effect. It produces a small body, just like The Hobbit's. So the mystery deepens. Is it possible that the world's scientific community is wrong about The Hobbit? To add to the mystery, completely new species of long extinct human relatives have started popping up all over. Most recently, in a remote cave in Siberia, where a tiny, preserved, human-like finger bone was unearthed with DNA unrelated to any of our so far discovered proto-human pals. Dr. Brianna Pobina is an education specialist from the Smithsonian Institute. She believes the Hobbit is just one of many previously undiscovered species and more will likely be found. New fossils are being found all the time. They often fit very well into the early human family tree. At least three other species of early humans have shared the Earth with our species, Homo sapiens. Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, or Neanderthals, and Homo floresiensis, the hobbit. Potentially, this new species found in southern Siberia, this pinky bone, could have even been a fourth species. One of the ways they've determined this pinky bone belonged to a new species was by examining its DNA. Recent technological advances make it possible to sequence the genes of long extinct species. But mysteriously, the hobbit's DNA has never been examined. Why? It turns out the original DNA samples were damaged. And more bizarre, since the first scientific paper was published, no one has been granted access to the original skeleton. The specimen has been kept pretty much under wraps by the discoverers. And I requested access to CAT scans, uh, CT scans, to, to check this out. And I was refused access. You're not allowed to publish if you don't make the material accessible to other scientists. Despite the debate, Homo floresiensis, a.k.a. the Hobbit, is now widely accepted as a new human species. There's a lot about human evolution that's still a mystery. In a way, it's like putting together the pieces of a puzzle. In the last 10 or 15 years, we've had an unprecedented amount of discoveries that tell us that the human family tree extends back about double the amount of time that we initially thought, that the number of human species on the family tree is about double the number that we originally thought. So these finds, these new genetic finds, the fossils, the archaeological evidence, really is filling out the human family tree, shedding light on some of the darker mysteries of human evolution. Hobbits might indeed have existed but their true origins may remain a mystery forever. Is that weird or what? So there we have it. Three weird mysteries, each with equally weird theories to possibly explain them. The U.S. military investigates the power of mind over matter. What did they find? Can we control objects or even kill just by using our minds? Or is psychokinesis just a trick of magic? A young boy and an elderly man both regrow their fingers after horrific accidents. Can we regenerate limbs simply by using powder extracted from a pig's bladder? Or on an Indonesian island inhabited by deadly Komodo dragons, archaeologists discover something extraordinary that could rewrite the history of human evolution. A tiny three-foot skeleton. Is this a new species of human? Do hobbits really exist? You decide. Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what?
box, if you will. Alexander focused his unit's time and resources into learning this psychokinesis. Amazingly, it wasn't long before he started to get results. This particular one was a lieutenant colonel. He was holding these forks just like this. They used to be matched. Um, this thing dropped over a full 90 degrees with all of us watching, came back up and went to where it is now. And you can see that, however you look at it, those are dramatically different. Absolutely no physical force involved. Encouraged by their success, Alexander and General Stubblebine started programs to train soldiers to use other paranormal powers like remote viewing. Remote viewing is a means of data acquisition. I guess you'd colloquially call it psychic spying. Uh, you had an individual who was in a chamber, in that case, usually at uh, Fort Meade. Uh, they were given specific targets, although they knew nothing about the target, and said, tell us about what's going on at that uh, location. The Russians had built a huge concrete structure on the White Sea in the Arctic Circle, but U.S. intelligence had no idea what it was for. Alexander asked remote viewer number one, Joe McMoneagle, to use his psychic use. Some soldiers felt they had experienced the paranormal while advancing through enemy territory in the jungles of Vietnam. They called it Point Man Syndrome. When certain people are on point, uh, they sense things like where are mines, where are ambushes and whatnot. Other people don't have that. Why? Don't know. John Alexander investigated psychokinesis, the ability to move objects just by thinking. His experimentation started with spoon bending. We had a session at my house. Uh, General Stubblebine, who was the head of uh, ISCOM, at the time was present and we had a truly phenomenal event occur directly in front of us. At this top secret session, a psychic was asked to demonstrate the power of the mind. The guy held up a fork and this thing just dropped over 90 degrees and we saw that and we said, wow, need to look into how you can do that sort of thing. And so that led to the process, uh, and we set up a program to do that. I ended up being able to teach this, and we used it not because bending cutlery makes any sense at all. It was to get mindset. It was how do you convince people not to think within the box powers to see inside. And he described the building. All they gave him initially, by the way, were coordinates, described the building then went inside, looked, and said, there's a big submarine in there. And he described it and says it's double hauled. It's, most interesting is that the uh, missiles are forward of the sail. And before that, all of them had been behind and a number of other technologies to which our boat builders said, you can't do that. If you build a submarine that big, it would go to depth and crush and whatnot. Well, guess what? It became known as the Typhoon class submarine. Again, our intelligence community had totally missed it because we had not heard that there were changes coming. We also did not believe, you know, this uh, cerebral centrism that anybody else could do it. Unknown to the U.S., the Russians had developed a, a new ultra-secret class of submarine, the largest in the world, with multiple titanium pressure hulls. And now, thanks to the supposed paranormal power of a U.S. Army soldier, the Russians' secret was out. Was this result an incredible stroke of luck? A coincidence? Or had the military application of remote viewing, psychic espionage, actually paid off? There's usually a... Throughout time, magicians, psychics, and mentalists have claimed that they can move or lift objects, walk through walls, affect the outcome of events, or even cause bodily harm using only the power of thought. But do these paranormal powers actually exist? Can humans really use their mind to affect matter? But come on, 
I hear you say. Psychic power? For real? What level-headed person would possibly take such a crazy idea seriously? Well, how about the United States Army? In the late 1970s, the U.S. military did something extraordinary. A group of top soldiers started to investigate whether the mind could be used as a weapon. Among them was retired U.S. Army Colonel John Alexander. We had been blindsided by the Soviets on several occasions. And so we had some senior leaders who were willing to explore uh, very unique areas, and paranormal phenomena was one of those. The Army set up a top secret operation called the Stargate Project. Its mission, to harness paranormal powers for military. You know what, I've been around for a while. I've traveled the world, met some interesting people, done some crazy things. So you might just think there's not much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer, others just defy logic. Does the brain have the power to kill? Can the mind become our most powerful weapon? The U.S. Army investigates the paranormal, asking if future conflicts could be fought using mind control. Or the boy who loses his thumb in a horrific accident, only to have it grow back thanks to a mysterious magical powder. Can we really regenerate our limbs and in Indonesia an incredible archaeological find did humans once share the earth with a race of hobbits yep it's a weird world 